Well, we are going back to um, dealing with 704C. So we have a contribution of uh, appreciated property and we have our methods for dealing with uh, 704C allocations, traditional, traditional with curative and remedial allocations. And we, um, we talked about the four or five step approach, it's pretty straightforward. Um, today, uh, when we dealt with last class, we dealt with non-depreciable property. So things like land or inventory are non-depreciable. Um, and that means that the 704C sort of reconciliation, if you will, is gonna happen at the end, you know, when the property is disposed of by the partnership. Next question is what if the 704C property is depreciable property? So depreciable property, things like equipment or machinery, um, you have um, tax depreciation on the equipment, let's say, and you have book depreciation on the equipment. So the, and remember step one in the, all of the methods is to calculate your book and your tax depreciation. So that leads to the question is how do we determine, how do we determine depreciation on property that's contributed to a partnership? You know, from tax one, when you buy property that's depreciable, um, there's a schedule, the depreciation schedule that you have on the property and uh, it could be in a method, straight line, five year, seven year, accelerated depreciation, so on and so forth. Um, what do we do about properties contributed to a partnership? So there are two rules there. Um, let's turn to the code. Let's turn first to section 168I7, 168I7. The heading is treatment of certain transferees. So 168 is the rule for depreciation of uh, property. Um, and this provides a rule. It, it's a little bit confusing. Um, it says in the case of pr any property transferred in a transaction described in subparagraph B, well, subparagraph B includes section 721, contributions to a partnership. The transferee, the partnership, shall be treated as a transferor for purposes of computing the depreciation deduction. So that just means that the partnership steps into the shoes of the contributor. So if the contributor was on a 10-year straight line depreciation schedule, whatever depreciation, uh, whatever years are left, you still you continue on straight line. So you sort of just continue on the depreciation schedule that existed in the transferor's hands that becomes a depreciation schedule in the transferee of the partnership's hands. Step into the shoes approach. So that means if it's, and in this class, we're always gonna be using straight line depreciation. Um, so what that means is that if there's, it was a 10 year straight line uh, and it's contributed uh, after year four, you'd have, uh, you'd have five years left, six years left, six years left. And so you would just depreciate the rest on the remaining six years. So you would just need to know effectively what's the remaining years in the depreciation schedule. And you would divide it by that number of years. So if you have 60 of basis and you have six years left in the depreciation schedule, your tax depreciation would be 10 per year, which is what it was if the transfer or the partner had held onto the property. So it just continues on along. And that's kind of maybe intuitive, right? It's a non-recognition transaction, 721. We just keep on chugging along with the same depreciation schedule. Okay, any questions on that? That's the tax depreciation. Now we have book depreciation. Now this is a little less intuitive because the book to the book value is going to be different than the tax value, obviously, because we're here in 704C. And so how do you depreciate the book uh, the book value. Well, that rule is found in the regs under maintenance of capital accounts. It's a capital account rule. Um, it's the books, the, the, the 704B book uh, rules. So that's found in, uh, remember our good friend, 1.704-1B2, four little I's is our ca capital account maintenance rules. 
dash one B two four little eyes. We're going to go to dash one B two four little eyes G three dash one B two four little eyes G three. G, the heading is adjustments to reflect book value. But the rule here is uh, we're looking at determination of book items. And it says the partner's capital account will not be considered adjusted in accordance with this paragraph unless the amount of book depreciation or amortization, amortization refers to depreciation on intangible value like goodwill so book depreciation book amortization depletion refers to like oil and gas stuff we're not going to deal with oil and gas so the book depreciation for a period of respect to an, uh, an item of partnership property is the amount that bears the same relationship to the book value of such property as the tax depreciation as a tax depreciation bears to the tax basis. So again, that's a long-winded way of basically saying that the tax, the book depreciation is going to be uh, depreciated at the same rate as the tax depreciation. And again, for straight line, what this means is however many years are left in the depreciation schedule, you're going to um, divide the tax basis by that uh, number of years to determine the yearly tax depreciation. And for book, you're going to divide the book value by that number of years to get the book depreciation. It's going to be the same rate. So you have four years left. You're going to divide the tax basis by four for each year. You're going to divide the book value by four for each year. That means the rate is 25% a year. Um, and that's what's going to happen here. It's a little bit more complicated when you're dealing with accelerated depreciation. The math is trickier. Luckily, we don't have to deal with that. So that's how we calculate book depreciation generally. We're going to see that there's a confusing exception to that general rule. But for now, this is the general rule. Any questions about how we calculate book depreciation? So then once we know to calculate book and tax depreciation, we can then apply the rules for the method, the 704C methods. Um, and let's see how we do that. So the example I'm going to use here, and there are good examples in the regs. So let's turn to the reg. This is 1.704-3. Let's turn to the dash three reg. Dash three B is the traditional method, which is what we'll start with, dash 3B. And then we've got B2, we've got these examples. So we're going to start with example one. We have um, A and B. They're each being 50-50 partners of everything, except for 704C. 704C has a requirement to um, allocate the built-in gain um, in accordance with 704C principles. They're going to use a traditional method. And they're A is contributing depreciable property with a tax basis of four and a book value of 10. And B is contributing cash. Uh, the next important thing to note here is that um, there's got 10 years of depreciation left on a straight line basis. The problem could be clearer. This problem is not that clear. It's a little confusing. That's what it's saying is that there's 10 years left straight line. The later problems are more clear about that. So let's see how this works.
got A and B. So A is contributing property with a fair market value of 10 and a tax basis of four. B is contributing cash of 10. We've got this depreciable property, we'll call it machinery. It has a book value of 10, a fair market value of 10 contribution, an inside basis of four. A is tax basis and machinery before, and we've got cash up here too. Okay. So then we go to year one, and we've got depreciation on in year one. And again, it could be that the property had a 20 year period, original period, and was contributed after year 10. So it's got 10 years left, but it's straight line. So that means you're going to get four divided by 10 each year, which is going to be 0.4 of tax depreciation every year, years one through 10. And book. Again, it's going to be at the same rate since it's 10% a year, or another way you could do it is just divide it by the number of years remaining. It's going to be one. So we've now calculated our book and tax items. That's step one in our four or five step process. Two, we allocate the book items, the book items. So that's going to be 0.5 of depreciation each year. because they're 50-50 partners. Step three, allocate to the non contributing partner. We're trying to get the non contributing partner the full amount of the book items equal to tax, tax equal to book. But the ceiling rule says we can't give them more than we got. So we can only give B 0.4 of tax depreciation. That's all we got. The ceiling rule here applies. This is a ceiling rule limited um, situation. Whatever's left goes to the contributing partner. There's nothing left. That's the fourth step. The fifth step, if we had curative or remedial, we'd have a separate, we have another thing to do. But with traditional, we just stop and leave it there. So at the end of year one, the book value, I'm sorry, the capital accounts, the book capital accounts are 9.5 each. And A's tax capital account is four, B's tax capital account is 9.6. And B isn't happy about this. I mean, this is where B would prefer another method, perhaps, because B is getting shorted a tenth of the, you know, $100 of depreciation. And just to show how this works, if we were to sell the property um, for nine, the next year, let's say year two, we sell the property for nine. So our book value is now nine. Our tax basis is now 3.6. So we sell it for nine. We have no book gain. Step one. Uh, step two, give the non contributing partner book items equal to tax. Well, that's easy when they're zero. Whatever's left goes to the contributing partner, which is going to be nine. Uh, we have uh, 5.4 of tax gain. So after the sale, a is going to get taxed on all the tax gain. And now our book tax capital accounts look like this. Now we've got 19 of cash, the nine from the sale, 10 from the cash. We would distribute it 9.5 and 9.5. 
A would recognize 100 of gain on liquidation. It's going to have cash distribution in excess of basis. B, we're going to see when you liquidate your partnership interest for cash and you have more cat, more basis than cash, you have a loss. So that 100 of loss that B doesn't get here, eventually B gets on liquidation. That 100 of, of income that A should be getting is not lost forever. He gets it on liquidation as well. And the problem goes through this. So part one of the problem here, let's just go back. So again, this allows you to go back and redo these problems because you've got, this is two little eyes is talking about just the allocation of depreciation. And then three little eyes is the sale for nine. And then four little eyes talks about then if we liquidate the partnership. So everything we just did is right there in this problem. So example one is a really good problem. You don't have to worry about example two. It's talking about unreasonable sort of abusive uses of the, these, these methods. We're not going to focus on that. Okay, any questions on that problem? And so the only, you know, this is all, yeah. go ahead. Can you remind me why A gets all 5,400 or 5.4 of the tax gain? Right. Well, step, step one says figure out the book and tax items. Step two says allocate the book items. Step three says give the non-contributing partner tax items equal to book items, but, but see the ceiling rule. Step four says whatever's left goes to the contributing partner. So this is whatever's left. And it's the tax gain. We have the amount realized is nine. We're selling it for nine. Our tax basis is 3.6. So that's the 5.4 gain. So we had zero of book gain and 5.4 tax gain. So step four is what tells you that. Does that make sense? It will eventually. Um, so yeah, I mean, remember, uh, we allocated the book, uh, we calculated the book gain and the tax gain. That's step one. We allocated the book gain to the partners. That's step two. Step three, we gave B tax gain equal to book gain, zero. Step four, whatever's left, which here is all of it, goes to the contributing partner. I mean, if you're, that's the technical reason. You're asking the conceptual reason why. What happens here is that A is getting six of book value, book cap, you know, book cap account without paying any tax. So that's the six of gain that B, A should be paying. Um, and so A is giving back 0.5 of that, and then he should be getting back. 5.5, but he only, he only had 5.4, he gets the other 100 at the end. But, you know, so this is all, the idea here is we're getting A to be taxed on that six of built-in gain. But that, that is A's six of built-in gain. And we're not gonna wait till the very end, you know, when he sells a property, we're gonna do it gradually through depreciation. And then we do it, you know, to take care of some of it on the sale. And sometimes what's traditional when the ceiling will, you don't, you still don't get a perfect result. You still have some reconciliation that has to happen at the end. Okay. So that is, let's just do one other uh, modification. Let's say same facts, except the property in A's hands had a basis of six instead of four. So everything's the same, book is still the same, B's book is still the same, A's tax gap is kind of six because the basis is now six, and now the depreciation each year for tax is 0. 0.6. So our book depreciation is one, our tax depreciation is 0. 0.6, 
So we allocate the book depreciation 0.5 and 0.5. Give the full tax equal to book. Here we can do it. We got ceiling rule limited because we have 0.6. So we give them 0.5. We match that up. That's what we're trying to do. Now whatever's left pours over to A. So of the six of tax depreciation, B is going to get 0.5. And A is going to get 0.1. We're not ceiling rule limited. If we then sell for nine, we would then have zero of book gain. Can B gets zero of tax gain, whatever's left, which is 3.6 goes to A. So A gets tax on all 3.6 of the gain. And now when we liquidate, we have no further gain or loss because when we distribute 9.5 to each, their outside basis is the same as their cash distributed. So they have no gain or loss. So we don't need, there's no reconciliation at the end. And that's because we don't have any ceiling rule problems because B is getting for tax exactly what he got for book. Okay, any questions on that? All right, well, let's go to another uh, problem. Let's go to, um, we're gonna go to, in the regs, go to um, dash three C, traditional with curative, Let's go to the example dash three C four, example one. So again, we've got one partner who's contributing equipment with a book value and a 10, a basis of four, 10 years remaining on its cost recovery. So that's more clear because it says remaining using the straight line method as we'll always use in this class. And in addition, F is contributing cash and they're going to use the cash to buy inventory. So to draw this up, you've got E, you've got F. F is easy, F is contributing the cash. B is contributing the equipment. Fair market value of 10. Tax basis of four. So the partnership has this equipment with a book value of 10, inside basis of four. And the partnership also takes the 10 of cash that F contributed and buys inventory with a book value and inside basis of 10. Inventory, this inventory is not 704C property because it's book value and tax basis are the same. Property purchased by the partnership is not gonna be 704C property generally. We're gonna see an exception. The other thing to note, inventory is not depreciable. Land is not depreciable. Inventory is not depreciable. And then we also know that when inventory is sold, it results in ordinary income or ordinary loss. Inventory is not a capital asset. So, and here they're gonna use traditional with curatives. And uh, so in year one, we've got, again, calculate the book depreciation, 10 years left. So we've got one per year of book depreciation and 0.4 per year of tax depreciation. So step two, 
allocate the book depreciation. Again, these are 50-50 partners under the facts. We each get half the book depreciation. Give the tax depreciation to F to match his book, but we can't exceed it. So we're stealing a little limited here. So we give him all we got. And then whatever's left here, there's nothing left, goes to the contributing partner. The other thing that happens is we're sold, we're told that the inventory is sold for 10,700. So we have 700 of book and tax gain on the inventory. So we would allocate that, the 700 of book and tax gain, that's gonna be 0 0.35, 350 to each partner. And with non 704 c property, the tax just follows the book. There's no difference. That's our year one depreciation. This is um, sale of the inventory. And if we use remedial uh, traditional method, that's it. That's, that would be the answer. But we're told here we have traditional with curative and the partnership agreement, you know, can limit what you choose, what you use curative for. But here it says cure as much as you, as much as you can. And we can cure because of depreciation is an ordinary deduction. The sale of the inventory is ordinary income. As long as there's that match, we can use it to cure. It's not impermissible. If this were capital gain, we couldn't cure an ordinary deduction problem with capital gain. Another question. Yeah. Why, why is the book gain 700 and not 1700? I thought we were doing sale price minus the book value at the end of year one. Uh, we're selling the inventory here. Yeah. So we're not selling the equipment, we're selling the inventory. We're holding. Oh, oh, because we're not depreciating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should have made okay. I mean, the, the facts uh, in the example say that we sell the inventory for 10.7. Sorry, I should have made that more clear. So at the end of year seven, we have 10.7 of cash. We have still have the equipment. We're not selling the equipment. This is year one still. This is just illustrating curative. And so again, with traditional, that's it. With curative, what it says is once we figure out that we can cure, the key here to getting curative right is look at the non contributing partner. And if there's a ceiling rule issue, which here there is, you're going to adjust the tax allocation for another item to offset the ceiling rule. So here, F is getting too little of tax deduction. He should get 0.5, he's only getting 0.4. So to make, to fix that, we can have a cure and we can give him too little of ordinary income. So we change this, instead of giving him 0.35, we just give him 0.25. One way to see that is if we aggregate these two, they should sum together. So this is a net negative 0.15, this is net negative 0.15. So we've taken 0.25 of tax ordinary income away from F, which F likes, right? And the flip side is that extra 0.1 of ordinary income is gonna to go to E. So again, to cure, we're gonna give him 0.45 of ordinary income. So instead of splitting the 700 of ordinary income, 350, 350, we're splitting it 250 and 450. And the way you can see that the ceiling rule that we've done it right is that afterwards, F's book and tax capital accounts are the same. E's are still different because we haven't fully resolved it. We're just sort of making our, through the depreciation, making our way towards resolving it. 
Um, so this is 9.85. Okay, so for F, he's going to get 400 of tax depreciation and 250 of ordinary income. E is going to get 450 of ordinary income. So if you have this method set up in your agreement, are you yes. basically stipulating that you need to make a transaction to even it out? Or are you stipulating there's going to be enough transactions, so we'll just even it out with another transaction? Well, no. So the agreement's going to say traditional with curative. This is the method we're going to use is traditional with curative. Whether it cures entirely depends on two things. One is, again, you can negotiate for a curative being limited, and we're going to see that in a second. So E might, would want curative to be limited. You know, um, F would want it to be unlimited. But still, even if it's unlimited, or if it's limited, if you just don't have enough items that are permissible to cure, you won't get a cure that year, a full cure that year. So if you only had... If we said we sold the inventory for, let's say we sold the inventory for 10100 instead of 10700 and that was all we had of ordinary income, ordinary deduction, then it would be 0 0.05 would be allocated book. And then the cure would be, you know, we would just give him F not, I'm sorry, it's positive, 0.05 income, it's gain. So 0.05. We would normally give F also 0.05 of tax, taxable income, but the way the cure would be to that. In that case, we've done a partial cure. We just haven't, we haven't gotten all the way there. We just don't have enough. But if we sell for 10.2, uh, 10.1. If we did it for 10.2, we'd be able to have enough. Because we, if we did 10.2, we sold for 10,200. Then we'd have 0.1. Point one, we give him point two. Okay, so John, you're quite you, so basically, if you're the partner that benefits from curative allocations here at F, the, there's a risk that there won't be enough curative allocations to fully ameliorate the ceiling rule. In which case, you're you know screwed a little bit. Um, now you can make it up the next year. And so it depends how long it's going to be, but that's, you don't, you, you don't contract to create, you know, I mean, I suppose you could, I mean, you could have a duty on the manager to sell property to, you know, to, but that you typically wouldn't see that, but it says whatever you do have, we're going to allocate um, disproportionately to sort of resolve the ceiling goal problem as much as we can. And your intuition might be, well, that's why F might be better off with remedial. Because of the remedial, we're going to know we're going to resolve the ceiling rule problem because we're just going to make it up. Curative relies on there being enough other items to cure. Remedial doesn't rely on anything. But we're going to see that it's a little more complicated than that when you get into nitty-gritty details of remedial. Okay, so that is example one that we just went over. So now we have. You can go down to example two. So unreasonable here, they say, well, you can't over cure. So again, if you, here they've cured by giving all 700 to E, which is not appropriate because they've done more than cure, they've gone you know, too far. Um, so again, uh, if this was fast or you need some more time to digest, I know this stuff is tough, but you've got um, the problems go through it just like I did. Um, but you don't have to worry so much about three little eyes, but that's a pretty obvious unreasonableness. The, the limitations for curative are you have to use the same character and you can't sort of over cure. You, you, you do the disproportion to the extent necessary to offset the ceiling rule and no more. 
So here in example two, we've got G and H and they're each contributing property, a 704C property. Uh, G's, they both have a book value of 10. G's tax basis is three. H's tax base is six. And so we've got the depreciation on each one. And they each have 10 years remaining. I'm sorry, they each have five years remaining. And there's also this thousand dollars of operating income that's there too. So we have depreciation on each of the two items in operating income. Net operating income, uh, it's basically our operating income less all other expenses other than depreciation. And they're going to use curative, but they're going to limit it. The partners have agreed that they're only going to limit, they're only going to cure with depreciation. They're not going to cure with other items, even if they can, because operating income is ordinary income. So they could conceivably cure with operating income, but they've decided to limit it to only depreciation. So let's see how this works. We've got G1 is property converted by G. And H1 property contributed by H. And so they each have it's five years left in the recovery period. So you divide the tax basis by five. So you're going to get 0.6 per year on the tax basis and two a book, two a book on H2 and 1.2 of tax depreciation on property on H H1. So for year one, the G1 depreciation we allocate the book one each. We find the non-contributing partner. So H is a non-contributing partner with respect to G1. So I try to give B H one of tax depreciation, but we only have 0.6 to give. Whatever's left goes to G and nothing else left. Year two, we haven't yet done the cure, but let's do what we would do under a traditional, and then we'll see the cure. Again, one a book to each. The non-contributing partner is G with respect to H1. So give him one of tax, and we give H. 0.2, whatever is left, 0.2. Now we've got the operating income, which is a thousand, it's just split 0.5. It's operating income, 0.5. And again, that's not 704C gain, so book tax just follows book. And with traditional, we just deal with this again, H isn't happy because H is feeling a little limited here. So now if they're allowed to use, if they're using curative, but they're only looking to um, depreciation to do the cure, uh, then 
again, the cure is going to be, okay, look at H. He's getting short change 0.4 of tax depreciation. Ceiling rule limited. So let's give him 0.4 more of tax depreciation from H1. We can't give him more from G1. That's the ceiling rule. We go look to depreciate an other property. And so we got depreciation on H1. We can give him another 0.4. So we're going to change this, make this 0.6. Go from 0 0.4, 0 0.2 to 0 0.6. And we're taking it away from G. Again, the, um, it's a little bit harder to see the correction here because you can't use what I said before, which is you can just sum it together because H has his own 704T issues. But you can just be confident that you've offset that. There's another way to express it. Well, I'll just stop there. So uh, the bottom line here is uh, 8.5, 5 5.3. So any questions on that? So again, since we shortchanged H 400 tax depreciation here, we effectively shortchanged G 400 depreciation there and give it to H. There's another way to express it, which might be a little more clear. Let's go back to the general rule. I mean, it's fine for you to look at it, to do it this way too. Wait, can you tell me what this reg is one more time? Dash three C four example two. It's good if you have your, you should have your book open. You could have it like in, um, next to you and you can see what I'm doing is consistent with, with what they're doing. Um, dash three, C four, example two. So how we started, we had, this was one, this was point two. So another way to express it, if you'd like, is you can make the curative allocations as a separate line and say, okay, we got to give H another 400 tax depreciation and we can do it. That's the key, we have enough. So you could just express it like this and then you give the offsetting curative effectively ordinary income to G. I'm fine either way, you're doing the same thing. You're, you're just taking, instead of collapsing into one line, you're doing it to two. But that's fine. But remember, you can't give an extra 400 of tax depreciation that doesn't exist. Quick question. Yes. Um, your notation on the right side with year one G1 and then year two H1. Yeah, I'm mean, sorry, year is one. That, sorry, okay. that's a mistake. Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, this is all year one. So all we did is, again, we did traditional for both. And then we cured the ceiling rule limitation on H with another item of depreciation from another property. The operating income is kind of red herring here. So you have to really focus on it. Okay. So it's like two wrongs make a right, right? We're not, we're not allocating this perfectly, you know, we have a ceiling rule, and then we're going to not allocate this perfectly either. It's a little bit harder to see because we have seven, two, two types of 704 C property. But yeah, so in other words, like here, we're not, we're not getting this right, but we are getting this right under traditional. Under curative, we're going to get this wrong and this wrong, but they're going to be both wrong in the right amounts, so two wrongs make a right. That's what I think about here. It is. Like two wrongs make a right. Uh, so that is uh, curative. Okay. All right. Now we move to, and that's kind of, again, you know, we go fast here. We got these problems. You can work these problems. There's problems in the book. We're gonna have a big set of problems on Wednesday. So we got lots of. 
attempts, lots of uh, opportunities to, to do this. Um, but none of this is really hard thus far. The hardest thing, you don't have to worry about example three. So again, keep track of which examples are useful. Example one, example two, and curative is very useful. Example three, you don't have to worry about. All right, so go to remedial. So here's a curveball with remedial, and it changes. It's this D2 dash uh, three D2 rule. And what it does is it says you change the amount of book items attributed to contributive property rather in the following manner rather than the general rules. So we're going to change the way you calculate book depreciation when you use remedial method. This is why the remedial method is not necessarily always a win for the non-contributing partner with respect to built-in gain. You think it might be a win because then you, have, you can make it up. You, you make it up, you don't have to rely on there being actual items to cure. But we're gonna see that the book depreciation has slowed down and that has ripple effects. So how do we calculate the book depreciation when we use remedial? And it says, you're gonna break the property up into two pieces. The portion of the pro partnership's book basis equal to its tax basis is recovered in the same manner as the tax basis. So the tax basis portion of your book basis is depreciated at the same manner as your tax basis, straight line over the remaining period. Then the remainder of the partnership's book basis, we call it the excess book basis, is recovered using any recovery period available to the partnership for newly purchased property of the same type as a contributed property. So that excess book basis is gonna be just, uh, depreciated like it's a new piece of property of the same type. And so with straight line, which is what we're gonna use in this class, that means you're gonna basically start the recovery period over. So you'll need to know the remaining recovery period and you'll need to know the original recovery period. So let's see how this works. Again, we got a good problem here. We go to D7, example one. Simple facts, L and M, 50-50 partners, um, straight line method, uh, tax basis of four, book value of 10, straight line method, 10 year recovery period. So that's the original recovery period has four years left. M is gonna give you cash, which is part you use to purchase non-depreciable land, right? Land, which is non-depreciable. So again, we put this, it's pretty straightforward stuff to start. They're each contributing 10 of value. So their book capital account is 10. L's tax capital account is four. M's tax capital account is 10 because M's contributing to cash. And they've got the land here, which is not 704C property and it's not depreciable. And they've got the depreciable property again, we'll call it machinery. Book value 10, tax basis of four. And they use the remedial method. So the key here with the remedial method, and this is the big curveball, that when you have a remedial method, we're gonna change the way we calculate book depreciation. Tax depreciation is still the same. We've got four tax bases and four years left on a straight line basis. We get one a year for four years. So year one, year two, year three, and year four, we're gonna get one per year. 
of tax depreciation. That's 168I7. That doesn't change when you use remedial. We're going to change the book depreciation. And so for book depreciation, what it says is that rule dash, uh, dash 3D2 says you take the book value of the 704C property and you break it up into two pieces. One piece is the piece that equals the tax basis. And the other piece is whatever's left, the excess book value. And it says you depreciate the tax basis piece just like the tax basis, 0.1 a year, four years. You take the excess book value, six, and you treat it like it's a new machinery placed in the service this year, which would mean you start the recovery period over 10 years. So you're gonna get 0.6 a year for 10 years. all the way to year 10. And your book depreciation total is gonna be the sum of these amounts. So that means for years one through four, your book depreciation would be 1.6. For years five through 10, your book depreciation would be 0.6. I'm gonna explain why, I mean, as I'm sure many of you are thinking like why, other than is this just sadism on the part of the reg writers or what? Um, there's a reason, but that just means that for the first four years, we're gonna get 1.6 of book. We get to year five, we're gonna have 0.6 of book and zero of tax. That's gonna be the same all the way to year 10. So instead of spreading the book basis over four years, like we did with traditional 2.5 a year for four years, we're gonna spread it over 10 years, 1.6 a year for four years, and then 0.6 a year for the remaining six years. Okay, and again, this is 1.704 dash three D2 special depreciation rule for remedial only. If the method we are using is traditional or traditional curative, then the book depreciation is just 2.5. You got four years left, 10 a book, you divide it by four. Okay, any questions on the book depreciation calculation? All right, so what, what impact does this have? Well, we go to year one, and we have our depreciation on the machinery, 1.6. Again, they're 50-50 partners, so we allocate 0 0.8, 0 0.8. We go give the non-contributing partner 0.8. and whatever's left goes to the contributing partner, point two. So we don't have any seal minimum problem with M. So we'd have to do remedials in year one. And just for quick comparison, what if we had done traditional, just for a second, if we had done traditional, the book depreciation year one would be 2.5. So we divide that 1.25, 1.25. And then we'd say, okay, give M, the non contributing partner, tax equal to book, we only have one to give. Whatever's left goes to L. So this is why actually traditional, even though it's ceiling rule limited, is better for M in year one, just looking at M1, uh, year one by itself, because M gets 1,000 of tax depreciation, but 800 in year one. 
on the remedial. This is where M might prefer traditional. And that gets to why we have this crazy rule, this curveball rule. The reg writers wanted to slow down the book depreciation because they were worried that tax planners, given the opportunity to make stuff up out of thin air, would play games and get results that were abusive. And so they slowed down the book depreciation. When you slow down the book depreciation, you reduce the likelihood and significance of remedial allocations in the early years. And this will be the same for years one through four. We would never have remedials. Let's do years two through four together, just combine. We're basically multiplying everything by three. So we get 2.4, 2.4. So in years one through four, we would never do remedials. We get to year five. Well, now we're gonna have remedials because now we're here. We've got 0.6 of tax depreciation. So that'd be, I'm sorry, book. That would be allocated 0.3, 0.3. We try to give M tax equal to book, we have no tax depreciation. Whatever is left goes to L, there's nothing left. We would now have year five remedials. We invent 0.3 of tax depreciation, give it to M, and then invent 0.3 of the opposite of tax depreciation, which is ordinary income, give it to L. So because of the special book depreciation rule, we didn't have remedials in years one through four, we kicked them down to year five um, through 10 and therefore would make creative tax planning a little bit harder if you wanted to abuse this. Their paranoia here of that, whenever you give taxpayers ability to sort of invent out of thin air depreciation, uh, deductions, you're going to do that and try to do it. You're going to try to give it to partners that like depreciation, like taxable partners with high rate in high marginal rates. And then you'll give the offsetting fictional gain, fictional income to partners that don't care about income, like tax exempt partners or partners with NOLs, net operating losses, or the like. And so, because of that paranoia, there's this, this you know, again, slowing down the book depreciation to reduce the significance of remedials by delaying them. And here it works, it delayed them. Because again, if we were doing remedials here, if we did the same book depreciation, we'd have remedials in year one, 0.25 to M. We can just combine year six through year 10 in another line, just multiply this by five, we have 1.5 remedials would be 10. At the end of the recovery period, uh, you would end up with five so uh, that's that. So again, I, I, it's really not that complicated. If you just you have to know when you if you have an exam question that says we're using the remedial method and you have depreciable property, you got to calculate the book depreciation in this weird way. And that's step one. That's part of step one. Calculate the book and the tax items. Well, calculate the book items. It's book depreciation. If it's depreciable property, again, you'll have a, the fact pattern. It'll say equipment or machinery or depreciable property or whatever. Then you got to worry about it. If it's land or inventory, it's non depreciable. You don't, you don't have to worry about it.
Okay, questions? Yeah. Um, why do we have point three of tax depreciation in year five? We don't have year three of tax in year five. We have we have uh, for year so for year six, we have point six of book depreciation. That's split it. and then yeah, you've and then we have zero of tax. What, so we, what is that line that that's says? These are remedials. Oh, that's what you did a remedial in year five. Year five yeah. And did you do a remedial after that too? Yeah, this is when we combining a year six through 10 all in one line. Oh, okay. We're just not doing it step by step. By yeah, step. I mean, you could, you know, you, I don't have enough room. And if you did, it gets repetitive if you do it. I mean, you could do it. It's not about it, but you, if you did years, you could do this all, you know, you have a depreciation schedule with 10 lines, but it, year one and year four, year ones, two, three, and four are all the same, and years five through 10 are all the same. So once you do one, you know how to do the rest. Why do we do a remedial in year five? Because we have our non-contributing partners, M, is getting 0.3 of book depreciation should get 0.3 of tax, but it's only, so it, there's the ceiling rule, book tax disparity, ceiling rule limited. Remedials cure the ceiling rule limitation. Okay, that's confusing to me because it looks like by the time we're done with year four, we've already hit all $4,000 of uh, the adjusted basis. It's yeah, no, it's not the 4,000, it's the six, a built-in gain. Okay. That's what you know, all we're doing is getting uh, uh, is is basically um, taxing L on that six of built-in gain, and we're taking depreciation away from him to, to do that. I mean, again, if you think about it, I mean, you can think about it conceptually. That's fine. Some people like to just follow the rules, and if you follow the rules, you'll get the right answer. But what M, what the dot, idea here is that M is really buying half of the machinery. And if M buys half of the machinery, M should get you know, depreciation deductions based on five. Um, but there's only depreciation deductions based on four. So that's the problem that we're dealing with here. But yeah, it's the six of built in gain that we're withering away through this by, mis by allocating depreciation disproportionately more to M. That's what we're doing. We're giving M more of the tax depreciation, L less of it. Okay. Is it weird to think about this, like in terms of, well, there's only four thousand dollars of a tax basis. So why don't we stop the depreciation allocations once we hit four thousand? Like, why base our al tax allocations on the built-in gain? Right, because M, well, because again, M, it's, you know, M, it's like M is buying half of this property. And if M had bought half the property for five, then M would get depreciation deductions over the life of the asset of five, right? But we only, so that's the idea. We were, we were trying to, we're trying to put M in the same position as if M had got, had bought the property, bought half the property. Okay, yeah, that makes more sense. Yeah, we're trying it. Yeah, it's another way of saying we're trying to make sure that L gets uh, is again, it's getting this benefit of getting 10 of book value, but it only pay tax on four. And we're trying to account for that in allocating the depreciation. And remember, if we don't do fix it this way, it's going to be fixed at the end, you know, at the end eventually. Um, Let's go back to the regs here. So again, just with remedial, and here's the rule. If the ceiling rule causes the book allocation of an item to non-contributing partners to differ from the tax allocation of the same item, the partnership creates a remedial item of income gain loss or reduction equal to the full amount of the difference and allocates it to the non-contributing partner and then simultaneously creates an offsetting remedial item, identical amount, allocates it to the contributing partner. So it's this sentence right here. This is what we're doing here. 
That's what we've done. There for year five and here for combining year six and 10. We said M is not going to be part of didn't get her full share of tax depreciation. Well, let's invent some tax depreciation, give it to her to eliminate that. And then we're going to flip it around and give the opposite to L, the contributing partner. So uh, that is um, D7 example one. Tutalized does years one through four, which is what we just did. Sorry. And then in three little eyes, we do these are, this is five through 10. And this is showing the remedial allocations. And at the end, uh, we did example two remedial. This is just, this is Black Acre. Uh, so there was no depreciation. So we, we did that last class. That's a good example. Example three is another example. Um, I'll just do that one because we got five minutes. It's a simple example. And then we'll be done. So this is Black Acre. So it's non-depreciable property. So if you see a problem and it's federal depreciable property involving land, then you, you say, oh, it's easier. I don't have to worry about this depreciation stuff. So here we get N and D. N is contributing the Black Acre book value, value is 10. Tax basis is four. D is the cash partner, which would be in 10 of cash. So you got the, the land here. And it's sold for three. So we're selling the land for three. So you sell 704C property, again, non depreciable, we don't have to worry about any depreciation upon the disposition, that's when we deal with it. Sell it for three, we got seven of book loss and uh, one of uh, uh, tax loss. Amount realized is three, book basis is 10, tax basis is four. So 0.3 of, I'm sorry, seven of book loss allocated 50-50. So each get 3.5. Give the non contributing partner tax loss equal to book loss. But the ceiling rule says we can only give D1. That's all we got. Whatever's left goes to the human partner. We got nothing left. So with traditional, we just stop there. But we've elected remedial. And so with remedial, Again, we look at the non contributing partner and we say, oh, non contributing partner got point shorted 2.5 of loss. Let's say it's a capital loss, long term capital loss. So we're going to give D 2.5 of long term capital loss. Made up out of thin air, but goes on the return. Reporting a transaction, reporting something that doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. It's phantom. It's fiction, but it's fiction that counts. So we're going to fix that again we've now given d the full amount and then we give the opposite amount to n again focus on the non-contributing partner that's how you get the 2.5 that's going to make it more clear um and so n is going to get 2.5 of gain and so at the end you're going to have resolve the book tax disparity So that's example three. Let me just tell you something note here. You should annotate this. I and mean, there's a mistake here. I mean, this, 
This is in the CCH. It's, it's not even the abridged version. It's in the actual regs. So the abridged version just copies exactly what's there, but that shouldn't be negative. That should be positive. So N is getting an offsetting allocation of capital gain. It's not reflected correctly here. It's not, they get it right here. Just a typo. Okay, questions on that? So all those examples, the examples in the book, there's a bunch of examples we've just done in the regs. Um, I would work on those examples. I'd prepare the examples, the problems for class on Wednesday. So we have another big set of problems doing the same stuff. And um, if you keep working these problems, again, if you want more problems, there is that Cunningham, Cunningham book, The uh, Logic of Subchapter K. I'm going to check and see whether that's on West Academic. So um, I wouldn't buy it until you check. It's on West Academic. It, just make sure it's not. Um, but um, it's more examples. You can create your own examples. Doesn't need, you don't need a whole lot of imagination. Value, property, basis of property, remaining recovery period. You can adjust all those things. And um, by the, you know, hopefully, soon you know you get it um, comfortable with all this stuff because there will be a 704c problem on the exam it's important um and so uh you'll see something uh, certainly on 704c in the exam okay any questions all right well then i'll see everybody on wednesday a reminder as i mentioned early in class no we won't have class on monday and tuesday of next week contrary to the syllabus so um, you can plan for not having these classes. Okay, see you around Wednesday. Bye-bye.